human beings have always used drugs of all kinds, for medicinal purposes or for pleasure. Alcohol, cocaine, morphine. The place where all drugs act is in the brain. Biology is now able to explain how they work inside of our heads, while research on drugs has enabled science to better understand how the brain itself functions. Hallucinogenic plants, as well as synthetic drugs, LSD or ecstasy, alter the contours of the mind. Peyote, mushrooms, ayahuasca. In order to communicate with the spirit world, witches, healers, and shamans have always used hallucinogenic plants. Psychiatrist Marc Valeur believes this ritual function makes hallucinogens the oldest drugs in the world. Hallucinogens have always played a very special role in society. They were probably the first drugs known to humanity through the use of mushrooms. Some theorists even link the beginning of humanity to this encounter with mushrooms. The cult of hallucinogenic mushrooms practiced by the Sumerians and Babylonians may in fact be one of the world's first religions. And we know that in shamanistic cultures, hallucinogens are the supreme way of establishing contact between humans and gods, between the profane world and the sacred world. In medieval Europe, healers and witches used datura, belladonna and henbane, plants whose hallucinogenic effects were the sources for stories about witches' sabbaths and flying broomsticks. The church saw them as manifestations of the devil. With heroin, it's the feeling of pleasure, of risk, the anesthetic effect. With stimulants like cocaine and amphetamines, we can see how the pleasure, the euphoria, the feeling of being in total control can be addictive. In the case of hallucinogens, it's something completely different. Often, people who experiment with hallucinogens may use them repeatedly. Some people like the hallucinogenic experience. They like that feeling of depersonalization, of taking a trip, of tripping. Writers and artists in the 20th century rediscovered hallucinogens. Antonin Artaud was introduced to the rites of the sacred cactus, peyote, by the Indians in Mexico. The poet Henri Michaud experimented copiously with such drugs and attempted to put the visions he had on mescaline, the active ingredient in peyote, into images. When I proposed to make a film on the visions mescaliniennes, I declared and repeated, and repeated again, that it was impossible to do the impossible. What we do, this drug is above. It's above the possibility of the impossible. 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 It's above the possibility of the plus instable, plus subtil, plus labile, plus insaisissable, plus oscillante, plus tremblant, plus martyrisante, plus fourmillante, infiniment plus chargée, plus intensément belle, plus affreusement colorée, plus agressive, plus idiote, plus étrange. Quant à la vitesse, elle est telle que toutes les séquences réunies devraient tenir en 50 secondes. Studying the psychoactive effect of drugs would have been impossible without rats or mice. They share many of the same genes as human beings, and drugs stir up the same kinds of tempests in their brains. In fact, all of humanity is morally indebted to these little creatures. We can intoxicate rats, manipulate their genes, even cut them up into little pieces. This is the terrible but necessary task of laboratories that compare the drugged or genetically modified rats to normal control rats. <laughs> 
LSD, like all drugs, works by hijacking the brain's communication system. Our brain indeed spends most of its time chatting to itself. In order to keep things running, it relies on a network of ongoing conversations between our 100 billion nerve cells or neurons. The neurons exchange information by sending each other chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. Whether it has to do with pain, pleasure, or the rate of information exchange, the neurotransmitters act as regulators, maintaining a complex and fine-tuned equilibrium, which is essential to all of our bodily functions. Between the neurons are little spaces which are always busy with activity. It is here in the synapse that the neurotransmitters do their work. They transfer information from one neuron to the next by binding themselves to the appropriate receptors. Very little research has been done on hallucinogens. Franz Wollenweider heads one of the few research teams in the world dedicated to studying their mechanisms of action in the brain. I was personally interested in uh, the phenome phenomena of uh, loss of ego boundaries and uh, LSD-like drugs are one of the few drugs or compounds that you can use in an experimental setting to induce this kind of state. So there's no other drugs that uh, uh, produce such profound alterations of the ego boundaries. So this starts as a loosening of the body environment relationship and the, the mind is profoundly changed so that you think you, you melt with the environment or the cosmos even so in an ecstatic state so this is so a profound experience and we had no idea about how does this work Bill? Hey Bill? Are you alright? Fine. Good. Good. What's going on? Colors. A thousand colors are floating. No, yeah, well, just float with it, man. You know, let it carry you down the stream. And go where it wants to go. You will find that you will become one with your surroundings. You will live in perfect harmony with the world around you. You can reach out to your hand and... Come on. What we found, and also a number of other peoples, is that this uh, loss of ego boundaries uh, maybe is the more important than the hallucination some people experience during uh, the intake of these drugs. Because uh, this loss of ego boundaries is... Uh, what can end up in, let's say, a kind of mystical states where you have a kind of union mystica, if it's really extreme, or it can go the other way where you are fragmented, where you are anxious and split, so you have no overview anymore about what's happening. <laughs> La presse entière s'est emparée du plus mystérieux et du plus tragique fait divers de ces dernières années, l'affaire du pain qui rend fou. La paisible petite ville de Pont-Saint-Esprit a été la proie de ce mal inexplicable qui a frappé près de 200 personnes. Des crises de folie hallucinatoires dues à la présence dans le pain de l'ergotine, le poison des céréales, ont fait plusieurs morts. La vente du pain a été aussitôt interdite et à Pont-Saint-Esprit, les biscottes ont complètement disparu. Le passage de ces corbillards devant une boulangerie close, c'est ce que la justice reprochera à un minotier qui avait trop aimé l'argent. The food poisoning that affected this French town was caused by rye ergot. While studying the derivatives of this cereal fungus in 1943, the Swiss chemist Albert Hoffmann who was looking for a cure for migraines, invented a drug that would revolutionize an entire generation, lysergic acid diethylamide, better known as LSD. In order to try and understand the effects, I decided to try this substance, the diethylamide, on myself. Being extremely cautious, 
I began with the smallest quantity that could be expected to produce any effect, that is 0.25 milligrams. When I got home, I found myself in an extremely bizarre psychological state. Everything around me seemed so strange that I feared I had gone insane. It was only a few hours later, when I realized that the symptoms were diminishing, that I was able to fully enjoy this extraordinary state of consciousness. I was totally aware of everything happening around me. I no longer perceived sounds as aggressive. On the contrary, they were magnificent, beautiful, deep. Colors, too, were enhanced. The atmosphere as a whole became positive. The world had somehow become a marvelous place. Just before that, it had been demonic, so to speak, but now I found myself in an enchanting world. After World War II, the CIA got hold of LSD and tested it as a truth serum. Several armies even experimented with its potential as an incapacitating chemical weapon. 25 minutes later, the first effects of the drug became apparent. The men began to relax and to giggle. But this man was more seriously affected and had to be removed from the exercise. After 35 minutes, one of the radio operators had become incapable of using his set, and the efficiency of the rocket launcher team was also very impaired. Ten minutes later, radio communication had become difficult, if not impossible, but the men are still capable of sustained physical effort. This man nearly succeeded in felling this tree using only a spade. But one hour and ten minutes after taking the drug, with one man climbing a tree to feed the birds, the troop commander gave up, admitting that he could no longer control himself or his men. In 1954, the writer Aldous Huxley published The Doors of Perception. In this book, he described the visions he had on mescaline and exposed the psychedelic experience to the general public. Do you think imaginative writers would benefit by that? Well, I think the people who would benefit most of all are professors. Uh, and this, uh, I think it would be extremely good for almost anybody with uh, fixed ideas and with, uh, with a great certainty about what's what uh, to take this thing and to realize that the world he is constructed is by no means the only world, that there are these extraordinary other types of universe which we may inhabit and which we should be very grateful for inhabiting, I think. Alexander Shulgin has devoted his entire life to the chemistry of hallucinogens. In his home laboratory near San Francisco, the 80-year-old chemist has invented more than 150 psychedelic molecules. He is considered a genius in the field, and his studies are published in scientific journals. I think the term that Huxley used, the doors of perception, was from um, Blake, originally. If I believe the whole quotation is, if the doors of perception were opened, we see everything as it really is. And I think the idea of making everything absolutely available and everything being seen in the same way that Huxley himself was trying to imply in his writing uh, is, is, is a dangerous thing. The, this is what a schizophrenia is. You have access to everything. You have access to, whoa, look at that little thing over there. Look at that thing. Look at these things there. And I remember this. And I remember that. And I talked to God and all this sort of thing going on. And you not you are not able to uh, conduct yourself in a in a socially safe way. So there is a uh, there's a negative side to opening the doors of perception. Yeah.
made primarily have been what are called psychotropic drugs, psychoactive drugs. Drugs are active on the mind. Um, the common term originally was uh, psychotomimetic drugs, namely things that uh, imitate psychosis. And then they become called hallucinogenic drugs, but that's not a very accurate thing because they don't really cause hallucinations. You recall very much what goes on in the amnesia that's associated with, uh, with the hallucinations. And I've always called them psychedelic drugs. LSD does not create real hallucinations, but instead alters or distorts our perceptions. This occurs because it interferes with the pathways of a type of neurotransmitter called serotonin. LSD binds to serotonin's 2A receptors, resulting in a hypersensitive awareness to colors, shapes, sounds, and physical sensations. In the 1940s and 50s, American psychiatrists became interested in LSD. Because it seemed to induce states similar to psychosis, they thought it might help them understand the underlying mechanisms of schizophrenia. Seeking a name for this type of drug, an English psychiatrist coined the term psychedelic from the Greek, meaning to manifest the mind. In the early 60s, a psychology professor at Harvard, Timothy Leary, became the guru of LSD. The effect is somewhat like looking through a microscope. Suddenly, uh, when you look through a microscope, you discover that there's an invisible world around you that you hadn't uh, known about before you did it. The same thing is true with a psychedelic drug. Uh, you're aware of processes that are going on inside your own brain. You're aware of the um, exchange of energies that are going on between your sense organs and the energies around them that you weren't aware of before. Timothy Leary's slogan, turn on, tune in, drop out, was taken up by an entire generation. The writer Ken Kesey, author of the famous novel One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, promoted the use of acid, a slang term for LSD, far and wide. He and his gang, the Merry Pranksters, traveled across the United States in a flower-painted bus, paving the way for the psychedelic movement and its imagery with their acid test events. By the mid-60s, the use of psychedelic drugs had become widespread. Acid became a way of life and was connected with the hippie movement, with the booming counterculture arts and music scene, and with the anti-war movement. Some politicians even declared acid to be more dangerous than the Vietnam War. In 1966, the United States finally banned all psychedelic drugs, including LSD, and other countries followed suit. So it became very hard for psychiatrists and uh, other medical persons to use these kind of drugs as a tool in research. So research really went down, and uh, with the development of new research tools in the 80s and 90s, some researcher came back to the question, how do these drugs really work uh, on the brain? And uh, how do they affect uh, the neurons and uh, not just the psyche? They were more interested to understand how do they uh, interfere with the neural networks, with the neurons, with the receptor sites. And so uh, a new uh, research started in the 90s. A lot of studies have been made on, on drugs that affect the brain. But on, on brain-changing drugs, you can use experimental animals, you can put in a radioactive something or other and <clears throat> take the head off and slice it in the brain into little sections and see where the radioactivity went. But this is not very ethical for humans. Although rats can't tell us about their LSD-induced visions, it was by observing what was happening in their brains that scientists began to understand how psychedelic drugs actually work. There seems to be an interaction between the effects of the drug and stress. When you give a large dose of either mescaline or LSD, one of the things that you notice is it produces catatonic behavior. Like this animal had a large dose of LSD, and you can see how relaxed he is, and you swing him around. 
the difference between a rat without any hallucinogen. One of the main things, you put him in a very bizarre posture and he just stays there, which is not true for a normal animal. Uh, hallucinogens have, uh, I would say, uh, three or four key effects. One key effect that everybody thinks about because the term hallucinogen uh, indicates that, that you will experience images or scenes we label a hallucination. That's something that has no corresponding stimulant in the outer world. So the brain produces the image. There's no uh, corresponding stimuli out in, in the world that you, for instance, you sit here and certainly you start to experience seeing uh, an animal that's not in the room. That's a hallucination. When you just see that uh, the walls are moving, gone with the flow, with the music, or are distorted, then this is an illusion, a visual illusion. So most of the people experience firstly visual illusions and only a few of them reported in true hallucinations, so seeing more than there is a really input for. LSD does not create real hallucinations, but instead alters or distorts our perceptions. This occurs because it interferes with the pathways of a type of neurotransmitter called serotonin. LSD binds to serotonin's 2A receptors, resulting in a hypersensitive awareness to colors, shapes, sounds, and physical sensations. LSD also acts on the systems of two other neurotransmitters. Glutamate is an information accelerator, so its activation explains the speed and confusion of thoughts when on LSD. Dopamine pathways are also stimulated, which accounts for the feeling of euphoria. So there are a number of secondary effects, or you can say it's a cascade of effects. So what we try to understand is how do these alterations, uh, how do they relate to the specific psychological or perceptual alterations we can see with these kind of drugs? In the early 90s, new brain imaging techniques were developed. Positron emission tomography and magnetic resonance imaging make it possible to observe the areas in the brain that are stimulated by the drugs. Franz Vollenweider and his team decided to use these new tools to start their research on hallucinogens all over again. We think that, uh, on the one hand, the profound alterations we can see with these drugs uh, when people are more in a euphoric, ecstatic state gives us a hint about, in the broadest sense, about how is the brain organized, how does it function when you experience a kind of ecstatic state. Very, very cool. Very, very groovy. And the other way, the other state, or the other pole of this ego dissolution, where you lose uh, uh, insight where you lose uh, autonomy and your ego gets fragmented and split, this uh, looks much more like a schizophrenia-like state. Usually a separate tent set up, which we call the trip tent. When a person comes in with this type of problem, the only way you can make contact is physically by hugging them, holding their hand, and trying to make them feel the presence of your body. And by holding a person, you give them a certain reality, the feeling of someone near them.
someone who's helping them. This state of profound anxiety induced by LSD is likened by Franz Wollenweider to ego fragmentation. In the brain, this sensation is caused by overstimulation of the thalamus, the information relay station, as well as by diminished activity in the cortex, a condition which also is found in schizophrenics. Franz Wollenweider associates the ecstatic state, on the other hand, with a feeling of oceanic boundlessness. It is linked to high activity in several areas of the cortex and to a temporary disabling of the amygdala which controls fear. So far we have uh, no evidence that uh, classic hallucinogens of the LSD type uh, result in a dependence. There is some psychological dependency that can occur, but basically there is no somatic uh, signs when you withdraw the drug that people suffer from withdrawal symptoms. So uh, this is unique to these hallucinogens. Alexander Shulgin tests the effects of each new molecule on himself, on his wife Anne, and on a group of volunteers. You're being recorded for posterity. Yeah. Okay. They start off with tiny doses, which are gradually increased and at each stage, they record their observations. I think probably one of the most memorable uh, was the uh, material 2CB, which I found to be a very, um, a very friendly, very gentle onset thing. One that allowed me to look to, at a museum, uh, at paintings, and begin to realize uh, for the first time why the painter painted what he did. And as you're seeing through the painting, paintings into the painter. And that, that sort of communication I found to be extraordinarily uh, interesting and quite provoking. Opening doors in your mind is a very essential thing to do because your mind is filled with all kinds of material, ideas, memories, recall, who knows, past lives, future lives, that are behind closed doors. And there's only one way of finding out what's there, and that is to open. Oh, better one at a time. Otherwise, you may be a little overwhelmed with a, with a rush of information. But I think that concept of opening the doors of perception is very, very important, very essential uh, for learning about yourself. You have a, you have a, everyone has a beast inside of them. It's one of Anne's favorite uh, areas when working with patients. Say, there's, a, there's, a, there's an animal in there that you don't know. You're, you're not, not the subconscious, the unconscious. The animal you don't know. And uh, you will never be at peace with a lot of your negative aspects, your, your psychological problems, until you get to know that animal a little bit. You may never agree with it. But her argument is not only should you know that animal, but just for a brief moment, look at the world through that animal's eyes. And that kind of thing can resolve many psychological problems. So that's a very real concept of opening that kind of a door. Though Alexander Shulgin uses chemistry to open the doors of his own perception, he is also aware of the risks involved and, far from being a fanatic, takes a very pragmatic approach to the psychedelic experience. I try not to be a chronic user of any psychedelic, because I want to keep a, a, a my, my main thrill is discovery, not exploiting, but discovering, and I want to keep myself open for that. Alexander Shulgin's most famous discovery would go on to become the most popular drug among young people today, ecstasy. The ecstasy molecule, MDMA, was in fact invented and patented in Germany back in 1914, but no use was ever found for it. The CIA also experimented with it as a truth serum without any results. Alexander Shulgin, who became interested in the drug in the 70s, found that it had some special features of its own. It was a, sort of a, an uninteresting middle-of-the-road chemical, and they dropped the whole thing. That was published about uh, in 1970, early 1970s, I believe. Uh, and then I heard about, uh, the, the, through, through a friend, of this material that was not a psychedelic, but it was being used in Chicago. And I found the structure of it, and I synthesized it, and, uh, and it was indeed a fascinating compound. 
And I, my, my main connection with the compound is I was the first to publish human activity. But uh, by no means was I the, the inventor of it. And uh, I uh, published a note with, uh, with a couple other people in the scientific literature as this as being an a opener of, of, um, of, of, of a person's uh, attitude toward his own self. And I suggested strongly that it would be a very excellent therapy tool. And indeed, it was used in psychotherapy for about uh, three or four years until it was made illegal. And they're used around the world, a number of places. All these kind of MDMA-like drugs are very different from, for instance, from hallucinogens, because they do not uh, primarily produce hallucinations. It's very rarely, maybe only with high doses. But uh, basically, they produce uh, a state of enhanced mood, of uh, facilitated communication. Some people say they are prosocial. MDMA was used clinically as a psychotherapeutic drug for several years. But after it was banned, MDMA, better known as ecstasy, came to be seen as a party drug. An effective antidote to fatigue, ecstasy is notably used by ravers at all-night dance parties. It is consumed by nearly 8 million people in the world today. Like LSD, ecstasy acts on the serotonin system, which is an important mood regulator. But it targets a different mechanism. In a drug-free brain, serotonin is recaptured by a sort of molecular vacuum cleaner, the reuptake transporter. Thanks to this cleaning system, the synapse is ready to receive another message. Ecstasy blocks the reuptake transporter. This leads to an outpouring of serotonin, which floods the neurons and engenders a feeling of elation and empathy. The problem, however, is that the serotonin stores eventually become depleted. The neurons are no longer able to function normally. If you take the drug in maybe two tablets or three tablets, we think that uh, all the stores get depleted, and so one or two or three days uh, it needs to, to fill up these uh, stores to, to uh, refill them. And uh, so what typically can happen that about a third of the subjects we have investigated in a control setting with a single dose, they say about uh, after two to three days they have a kind of midweek blue. At the cellular level, ecstasy affects the serotonin neurons With the help of medical imaging techniques, it is possible to see exactly which areas of the brain are affected by the drug. When it reaches the striatum, Ecstasy facilitates movement and creates a sense of euphoria. It also acts on the amygdala, which explains the absence of fear, fear of others, fear of oneself, and results in the famous feeling of empathy that users are seeking. But ecstasy also affects various parts of the cortex, such as the prefrontal cortex, which is regarded as the seat of intelligence. It is precisely in this area that ecstasy damages the serotonin neurons. We think if you now take these drugs every weekend, so your brain uh, state can be profoundly changed because then it's a chronic treatment. It's not a single dose or one happening. So this may lead to complete alterations of uh, of the capacity of the brain to produce serotonin, to release it, to produce it. So we think this is uh, the bad side of, of MDMA, if you use them often 
If regularly attacked by ecstasy, some serotonin-releasing neurons may not be able to recover. Animal studies show that ecstasy can be neurotoxic, that is, can damage neurons. The neurotoxic effect appears to be irreversible and can lead to chronic depression. I think that MDMA, like no other drugs, has a much higher neurotoxic potential and is much more risky than other uh, drugs that are comparable, uh, have comparable effect uh, to MDMA than, for instance, hallucinogens, which we have never seen any long-term alterations. So MDMA is a special case and it's hard to give recommendations and it's better not to, to use the drug frequently. And uh, if anybody is asking, we would say, better leave your hand off the drug. You're on the safer side. In spite of these risks, some psychotherapists would like to use ecstasy as a therapeutic tool to help patients suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. It was the shell shock symptoms shown by Vietnam War veterans that led physicians to identify this psychological dysfunction, which until then had never been officially diagnosed. Psychologist Jose Carlos Busso has prescribed very small doses of MDMA to patients who are victims of rape or sexual abuse. Bueno, el trastorno de estrés postraumático. Post-traumatic stress disorder encompasses a variety of symptoms that appear when people are exposed to an extremely traumatic event, such as sexual abuse, an act of terrorism, or any other kind of violent act. The bomb has exploded in plein cœur du Grand Marché de Tel Aviv. Une trentaine de blessés sont immédiatement évacués vers les hôpitaux, deux dans un état critique. Il y a au moins trois morts, parmi lesquels le terroriste. Selon les services israéliens, il avait 18 ans, il est venu d'un camp de réfugiés proche de Naplouse et serait passé par Jérusalem. Plusieurs personnes sont en état de choc. These people relive the traumatic event over and over again, involuntarily, with the same emotional intensity as at the time of the event. They also have intrusive thoughts, images in their mind that disappear, thoughts that are completely distorted or distressing. They are in a permanent state of hyper-alertness that sensitizes them to any stimuli that might remind them of the traumatic event. In addition, there's usually high comorbidity with other disorders, depression, obsessive compulsive behavior, etc. People who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder tend to see the world as a threatening place and to see themselves as unable to function in this world. MDMA has a very specific effect on fear. It doesn't act on all those types of fear that are connected with everyday life or living, but on those fears arising from a particularly stressful or disturbing situation. It's as if MDMA acts directly on this type of fear and eliminates it, or at least reduces it for a few hours or as long as the pharmacological effect of the MDMA lasts. This then allows people to work on their inner feelings and experiences without being in a state of constant fear.
Jose Carlos Busso's patients were only given very tiny doses of ecstasy. But because of the risk of neurotoxicity, the university's administrators put a stop to the research project. Other experimental studies are now being done in the United States. My impression is that MDMA could be medically very useful for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. But unfortunately, I can't prove it with data. We just hope that one day studies can be done in order to find out for sure. But the ecstasy that circulates in discotheques often contains dangerous substances that have nothing to do with the MDMA used in these experimental therapies. Clandestine laboratories have also created new designer drugs that are becoming more and more popular. Such synthetic drugs like GHB or ketamine lead to altered states that go from complete helplessness to out-of-body experiences. It's difficult to describe the effects of ketamine or disassociative drugs because the subjects tend to have very different experiences. It's a little like sudden withdrawal from the world. Some descriptions of ketamine experiences sound like what other people have described as near-death experiences. We might say that these substances can give people the sensation of retreating from the most evolved parts of the brain and regressing swiftly to a vegetable state or to a reptilian or vegetative brain state. It's an experience that some people in particular seem to like. Maybe the idea of identifying with a vegetable is something that, that is actually quite exciting. I think recreational drug use is tending towards polyconsumption. Users can choose from an entire menu of psychotropic substances based on the effects they are seeking throughout the night. If you are a little too high, you can take a depressant to bring you down. If the effects are wearing off, you can take a little more for a pickup. In other words, you can play it by ear. Although this is actually the most extreme image we can have of users. On the other hand, this is also happening in so-called normal, everyday society. We are surrounded by more and more drugs, or what's called lifestyle drugs. For example, Viagra, for treating impotence, or the antidepressants that are taken by people who are afraid of speaking in public. I think this is a widespread phenomenon everywhere in society, both in terms of pharmacy drugs and illegal drugs. Asked what the drugs of the future will be, scientists and psychiatrists tend to think first of their medical uses. The line between drugs and medicine is becoming more and more permeable, and the future promises to be full of synthetic substances. A pill-popping civilization. Aldous Huxley describes such a nightmarish scenario back in 1932. His novel, Brave New World, is about a society that is regulated by an omnipotent drug called Soma, which either uplifts or tranquilizes people depending on the dose. You do, uh, of course, anticipate this world of uh, tranquilizers and pep drugs and truth drugs in your novel, Brave New World, uh, to, to some extent. 
Yes, I was, of course, there. I, I projected these things uh, five or six hundred years into the future, and it is rather alarming to find that only 27 years later, quite a number of these uh, forecasts have already come true, and come true with a vengeance. It's hard to know what the drugs of tomorrow will be like because we're living in a world that is, no doubt, increasingly open to synthetic substances. Some people are very critical of these trends, of course, but we can clearly see that psychoactive medicines are being used more and more for purposes that are not strictly therapeutic, that is, for purposes other than treating declared mental illnesses. That's the problem with treating depression nowadays. We no longer know where to draw the line between the norm and depression. That's the problem with treating anxiety. We no longer know how long the anxiety attack should last before we should start treating it. And the same goes for insomnia, etc. The consumption of antidepressants, tranquilizers and sedatives in industrialized countries has skyrocketed. That we are systematically turning to synthetic remedies of this kind raises a lot of questions about how our societies are evolving and the demands that are being made on individuals. In my opinion, the drugs of the future will probably be antidepressants, mainly because the rates of depression in the Western world are increasing exponentially. But if these medicines were effective, or as effective as they'd like us to believe they are, the depression rates would certainly be going down. In other words, the medicine of the future should be adapted to society, should be able to address its psychological problems and not the opposite. We live in a world that is giving rise to more and more disorders linked to anxiety, stress, depression. We need to design medicines that will specifically tackle this kind of disorder and not the opposite. That is, taking all of our expensive medicines and trying to match the disorders to fit these medicines. There are some hardline physicians who would like us to treat only clinically declared illnesses and who think that people are atrociously over-medicated nowadays, that all psychological ailments are treated with medicines that will soon be waking up with wake-up pills, going to sleep with sleeping pills, having sex with sex pills, and eating with pills that make you hungry, etc. Personally, I'm not that pessimistic. I think that it's actually how people use these substances that will determine whether they are harmful or beneficial. The gap between illicit substances and synthetic medicines is shrinking. Society seems to have lost its bearings and the future remains unclear. Surrounded by new drugs and medicines, relentlessly compelled to perform, will the men and women of tomorrow be mere zombies soused with synthetic cocktails? Or will they be able to invent a more intelligent use for these mind tools? The answer lies not in the laboratories, but inside each and every one of us in the way we evolve. <laughs>